The truth was, I wasn't sure that I belonged. I doubted myself and I wondered, wondered if I was good enough to even be there, if what I was doing in the world, albeit important and meaningful as far as I saw it, was it deserving to have a seat at this table? Harry and Meghan fled the royal family for a second chance at the private life they always wanted. But despite their escape, the world kept on telling and retelling their story. In order to set the record straight, they decided to create a tell-all documentary series with TV giant Netflix. They feel very wronged, but they can't ask for privacy when they've made the Netflix series. It's opening up a can of worms. You'll watch that series and think, the royal family need looking after, they've come out of it better, or you'll be on the side of Harry and Meghan and think, wow, they had to put up with a loss and I'm on their side. Whether they wanted it or not, they stepped into a war with the tabloid press. The, the, the resentment towards his brother uh, for the, the protection that he's had is palpable throughout. Of course, those who would be supporters of Prince William would say, look, Prince William is just doing his duty. And now, what was once a healing wound between the couple and the royal family has become a great divide. On December 8th, the all-access documentary series released, titled Harry and Meghan. I think there's a sort of sense of both disappointment and exasperation at the palace uh, that the couple feel the need to keep going on about how miserable they were in their royal existence. At the same time, uh, you know, the couple feel that they, they, they need to keep telling the world why they left. You'll watch that series and think, the royal family need looking after, they've come out of it better, or you'll be on the side of Harry and Meghan and think, wow, they had to put up with a loss and I'm on their side. The Sussex brand, both in the UK and America, uh, is being helped in one way uh, by this Netflix documentary series by bringing uh, the Sussexes back onto our radar screens, if not our TV screens. So uh, there is perhaps a fear that out of sight means out of mind. Uh, and by uh, a cooperating with Netflix on a documentary like this, it gets us all talking about them again, uh, and it keeps them uh, in the limelight, and it keeps their, their brand uh, of Harry and Meghan uh, alive. This was the couple's attempt to get across their own side of the story from their meeting and attempts to integrate into the royal family through to their departure. The series is unlike anything seen before, only close in comparison to the Panorama interview with Princess Diana in 1995. Years of stories half told and whispered through the media were expanded and clarified. The couple's first introduction was via an Instagram post, Harry revealed. Meghan spoke about the whirlwind of pressure meeting Prince William and Princess Kate for the first time. Meghan even demonstrated her curtsy from the first nail-biting visit to the late Queen Elizabeth II. Meghan claims that her wardrobe was strictly controlled during her tenure as a royal. Barred from bright colors to avoid clashing with the queen, Meghan chose to wear camel and beige in order to blend in and not stand out. Harry, the Duke of Sussex, is seen in the show proclaiming that royals don't marry for love. Instead, they feel incredible pressure to marry someone that fits the mold. The fallout from the series has seemingly caught the entire world in a fierce debate, and it seems everybody has something to say about what the couple had to say. When they were growing up, William and Harry's relationship was incredibly close. The two of them really needed one another. They had a, you know, an unhappy home environment. 
they were, luckily they did have nannies and they were therefore kept away from quite a lot of the acrimony that was going on between their parents. But nonetheless, you know, children pick up on, on things. They're very sensitive. And it was also fortunate that they went away to boarding school because again, that removed them from most of, what, of the nastiness that was going on. But it, they did rely on one another. They were very close. The, the two are very different characters, but they, they complement one another very well. And they've always had a great banter. They tease each other mercilessly, or used to. And then when their mother died, I think that brought them even closer together because they couldn't share with anyone else what they had experienced. It, it wasn't, you know, like the death of, a, of any other, any normal parent, because in, with the death of a normal parent, you don't have the world grieving as well. It was almost as though their grief was being devalued by the grief of strangers. So I think it was a very difficult time for them. And, and during that, sort of the, the years after Diana's death, there was a bond which was closer, arguably, than, than most siblings. I think the time when that bond started to fracture a bit was when Harry probably came out of the, uh, out of the army and started going into royal work. And I think there was a little bit of, the space was was quite small within their charitable world for the two brothers together. And I think Harry slightly railed at the hierarchy. Here was his brother, you know, his mate, but who was slightly pulling rank at times because where, you know, because he was the senior senior member of the family. So I think there were one or two little niggles going on there. I suspect that when William married Kate, I mean, Harry adored Kate and Kate adored Harry, but I suspect that as with every family, when one sibling marries, their focus turns slightly onto their, their new wife or husband um, and then their children. And where previously their full focus had been on the sibling. So I think maybe, you know, there were rumblings but Harry, you know, got on very well with them right up until, I would say, the time that he met Meghan. On January 13th, 2020, royal watchers were on the edge of their seats as Harry and Meghan entered what was infamously called a crisis meeting with Her Majesty the Queen, Prince Charles, and Prince William. This was the deal or no deal moment. The future of the royal family was hanging on the outcome of this critical talk. After several tense hours, Buckingham Palace announced with a heavy heart that arrangements had been reached for Harry and Meghan to leave royal duties behind and pursue an independent future. I mean, this is the real problem for the Queen and Prince Charles. They are dealing with this as a grandmother and as a father on the one hand, and they're also dealing with it as the protector of a ancient dynasty. And we have seen that how as protectors of the ancient dynasty, when they need to, they act brutally as they did with Prince Andrew when they removed him from public office. There may be a point that at some stage that the Queen, Charles and William believe that what Meghan and Harry are proposing is a threat to the institution of the British monarchy, then they will act. Well, I think these decisions have all got to be made in the future. Anybody who's high profile needs the protection. Former prime ministers and ministers of defence uh, get security for a long period after they've left office. So I think that's something that everybody would suggest that they, they require to get uh, security. But these all, decisions will surely all be made in the, in the next few days. All the way through this relationship, we've seen examples of Harry trying to protect Meghan from the scrutiny. You have to remember, Meghan comes in the legacy of Princess Diana, and Harry saw the way his mother was treated by the press. 
And I think he's very keenly aware of how that happened and, and ensuring that that doesn't happen to Megan. The decision to move away from Central London to go to Frogmore Cottage and move to Windsor is very much about protecting Megan. You know, they had just redecorated the place in Kensington. They had just done it up the way they wanted to when they announced they were actually decamping and moving to Windsor. By moving to Windsor, Harry and Megan are hoping to preserve some semblance of normalcy for themselves and for their child. Even if you look at the birth of the new baby, whereas Kate Middleton was trotted out in hosiery and full makeup just hours after delivering her babies, Megan said from the beginning, I won't be doing that. They didn't even announce she was in labor until after the baby was safely born. All the way through the birth, even in the last weeks of her pregnancy, Megan was not seen. And all the way through her birth, Megan has maintained a determination, along with Harry, to keep certain things private, to keep protected their family. And they are not following the royal script. They are consistently deviating from what's been done before. And some people think it's admirable and some people think it's not. But ultimately, Megan and Harry are doing things their own way. Public reaction was divided, to say the least. While some wished the couple nothing but happiness and success, others felt resentment in abandoning crown and country. The media press of it really speaks to the culture war that's happening in this country between older, the older generation is outraged by Harry and Meghan's decision and the younger generation, um, which is mostly supportive. I think the whole plan that Harry and Meghan have is a really problematic one because they're talking about stepping back. They're talking, their critics would argue, about having their cake and eat it. They're talking about one day representing the Queen on a foreign tour to a, a, another country, on another day, say, in North America, earning serious money with some sort of endorsement of some sort of product. The, the risk is that those two things aren't compatible. The risk is that their pursuit of money will uh, tarnish the Windsor brand and tarnish the House of Windsor. There's no doubt that the reaction inside the palace was just as divided. It's definitely sad for the team at Buckingham Palace. They have a superb team there who've been fiercely loyal to them. I think the assumption would have been that there would have been possibly a core um, number of staff who would have been retained to run some kind of operation here for them. They've decided against that. They're severing all ties. It's a really strong signal that they are off on their own now in America and Canada. The now free couple announced a new future of financial independence, stepping back from the royal family, but insisted they would continue to support their causes and of course, Her Majesty the Queen. They shared their plans to split their time between North America and the UK. It's felt like their farewell UK tour. Five engagements in five days, covering off the official, the causes that matter to them, and taking time to say thanks to their friends. But it is the event they'll attend here at Westminster Abbey that is the most significant since they've returned from Canada. Because when they arrive at the Commonwealth Day service, it will be the first time that we've seen them alongside other members of the family since they announced they want to step back as senior royals. And everyone will be watching the body language. Every year since they got married, they've been to the service. Reaching out to the Commonwealth has been a big passion for both of them. Their attendance this year will be a reminder that whatever has gone on behind the scenes, they are still family, as this is one event that is hugely important to the Queen. When they got engaged, there was a sense this was a couple excited about what they could achieve together. A few days later, they carried out their first walkabout, but the scrutiny has proved too much and palace life too stifling, leaving the Queen with no option but to agree they can step away at the end of this month. In just over two years, they have fulfilled every aspect of royal life. Today is expected to be the last of those official duties. In the end, their life together had to come first. And just like that, as quickly as the whirlwind romance had started back in July 2016, less than three years on, they were gone.
you know, the monarchy finds itself in a moment of, of turmoil, flux and a genuine crisis because, of course, this has opened up a Pandora's box. There are so many wider issues at stake. The future of the monarchy, this streamlined monarchy that you keep hearing people talking about. What does that actually look like if Meghan and Harry do step down? Uh, a lot of you tonight have told me you have my back. Well, I'm also here to tell you I've always got yours. On their new website, the Duke and Duchess published what was effectively a manifesto of how they're going to deal with the media in future. And part of it was an attack on this, and specifically British media and royal correspondents for their monopoly on royal coverage, and essentially accusing the media of making private profit from their very public lives. They talk specifically about the Royal Rota, where British media cover royal events to be distributed around the world. Obviously claims they feel they've been, been hounded by the media, etc. But in reality, they've had, there's been nothing like that. Um, the, oh, the come Royal, on, you would say that. No, the Royal Rota system works, I think it's given them an awful lot of, works very, it's been going since the 1950s. And one must remember that this is an unelected institution that relies upon media, publicity, the public support for its life's blood. They are in control, they release the images, they choose who comes and talks to them. I mean, that's a relationship that works in Hollywood, that's a relationship that works with celebrities. It's a great open question whether it's a relationship that can work with a senior active member of the British royal family. As a first step into independence, the couple founded Archwell Incorporated a non-profit foundation for change. The couple went on to found Archwell Productions and signed multiple huge media deals with Netflix and Spotify for a series of inspirational documentary and podcast productions, reportedly worth around 18 million pounds. Megan fell pregnant very quickly. They hadn't been married that long when she got pregnant. And according to all reports and rumors, they just had just started trying and she got pregnant. Now, Megan was not uh, extremely young, you know, in, in pregnancy terms, 36 is geriatric. I mean, that's literally the term. So I think they didn't want to wait around. They knew they wanted a family and they didn't know how long it would take, but it happened very quickly. And I think both Megan and Harry we're surprised at how quickly it happened, but it's all the more of a blessing. Megan is very much a belly cupper. Every single picture we saw when she was pregnant, she was cupping that belly. Sometimes we had a double cup above and underneath the belly. You know, this is something a lot of celebrities do on red carpets. Meghan Markle is a celebrity. She's an actress. She knows about angles. She knows about what makes a good picture. She knows about what's a good story visually. She's smart and she has used some very smart strategy in her role. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way, to, to use the knowledge you gleaned in one field and career in another one. Meghan Markle has been one of the most stylish pregnant women that we've ever seen. She didn't favor maternity clothes. She tended to wear designer clothes, which would accommodate her bump. Meghan has a very slim, long, lean, beautiful figure, and she was able to wear designer clothes all the way through. She looked gorgeous the entire pregnancy. The only visible difference apart from the bump was her face was perhaps a bit fuller, and, and actually it just made her look even younger to have the kind of rosy cheeks that she had through the pregnancy. Pregnancy very much suited her, and I would be shocked if this is the only baby that these two are going to have. Megan's pregnancy was actually announced during her first royal tour and there was a backlash actually because it was announced so soon after Princess Eugenie's wedding. A lot of people felt that it had stolen the thunder for poor Eugenie who had gotten married literally like the day or two days before. It was ridiculous because Megan has the right, first of all, to announce her pregnancy anytime she wants to. And probably they waited until after Eugenie's wedding to announce because they didn't want to steal her thunder. But Megan was in the middle of a royal tour in which she was probably going to miss engagements due to morning sickness or fears for her getting pushed to jostle too much in the crowd. She had to explain herself and she had the right to stay home if she was tired one morning when she was in the early throes of pregnancy. So I think Meghan and Harry felt they had to announce in a way because she was in the middle of a world tour, she probably was going to get a little more tired and there might be 
obvious bump pictures, which would just set off a fury of speculation. Megan showed very early in her pregnancy. She was only a, a little bit pregnant, and she already had a bump. So I think it was a necessity, really, for Harry and Megan to announce the pregnancy as early as they did. Prince Harry, um, anything you just want to share with, with us the world? Uh, yes, um, I'm very excited to announce that uh, Megan and myself had a baby boy um, early this morning, a very healthy boy. Um, mother and baby are doing incredibly well. Um, it's been the most amazing experience <laughs> I can ever um, possibly imagine. Um, how any woman does what they do is beyond comprehension, but we're both absolutely thrilled um, and so grateful to all the love and support for everybody out there. Um, from everybody out there, it's been um, it's been amazing. So we just wanted to share this with everybody. I'm so incredibly proud of my wife, um, and as every father and parent would ever say, you know, your your baby is absolutely amazing. But this little thing is 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 absolutely to die for. So I'm just over the moon. Megan's baby shower was very much a baby shower for a celebrity, not a baby shower for a royal. I don't even know if Kate Middleton had a baby shower. But if she did, it was probably like in someone's house with a cup of tea and like a few finger sandwiches. This was not going to be this like amazing, over the top, celebrity fueled, filled event. Megan did her baby shower as a celebrity. It was thrown by a celebrity, Serena Williams, and it was attended by celebrities and it looked like something celebrities would go to. Megan, in unfairly really got a lot of backlash because the truth is how many women are involved in the planning of their own baby shower the answer is zero megan had probably nothing to do with it had knew nothing about it except that she was supposed to show up in new york on this date and amal clooney said look i'll give you a ride in my jet the over-the-top extravagance of the shower has more to do with megan's friends than it does with megan herself one thing that was very sweet about the baby shower was Megan actually didn't open any of the presents. She wanted to wait and open them together with Harry. She took them all home with her and they opened them together as a couple. This is really unprecedented. I mean, normally one of the highlights of a baby shower is watching the mother-to-be open everything. So this broke with tradition, but she didn't want Harry to miss out. In the lead up to the birth, uh, Harry and Megan both said they didn't want to know the sex. They wanted it to be a surprise. So they had to obviously then choose girl and boy names. Had it been a girl, Diana was very much a favorite name and I believe it was very likely that Diana would have been the first name or at least in the middle of that um, long name and the reason is you know from the beginning Harry and William both have included their mother whenever possible in their relationship and I think it grieved them both that she wasn't there when they married uh, she wasn't there to see her grandchildren and so I believe with all my heart Diana is probably in future going to be a girl's name for this pair. In terms of boys' names, there were a lot of names initially floated around. They were all connected with royal tradition, but not typically traditional. So for example, Alexander, which is a perfectly acceptable English royal name, but not as commonly used. And, and other sort of middle names that the royals have had, like Arthur, were two of the names that were favored at the beginning. On March 7th at 8 p.m., CBS aired the landmark interview led by TV legend Oprah Winfrey. The two-hour interview has caused an incredible fallout, the magnitude of which still cannot be fully understood. It was the interview that some within Buckingham Palace must have feared. But the Prince Harry and Meghan Markle discussion with Oprah was more revealing, explosive, and potentially damaging to the royal family than many could have imagined. Harry and Meghan left as working members of the family, left the country, went to Canada first, then America, and then gave that devastating interview to Oprah Winfrey, in which Meghan said that Kate had made her cry just before her wedding over a bridesmaid's fitting, where there had been a rumor long before that Meghan had made Kate cry. So in this interview, she wanted to correct that story and make it clear that Kate had made her cry. Allegations of racism within the family itself and Meghan's admission that she felt suicidal during her pregnancy have been splashed across newspapers in the United Kingdom. Throughout their two-hour TV special, both Harry and Meghan spoke with eye-opening candor, delivering accusations and rebukes that outweighed even Princess Diana's landmark interview more than two decades earlier. Prince Harry's relationship with the media went bad and has got progressively worse 
ever since uh, his mother died. He believes uh, deeply and profoundly that the media contributed to his mother's untimely death. So ever since her death, he has tried to find an accommodation. And that accommodation has been his acceptance that the intense interest in him could be used by him to throw uh, focus on issues that he is passionate about. Megan, can you tell us what it's like becoming a new mum and tell us a little bit about Baby Sussex, as we're calling it? <laughs> um, it's magic. It's pretty amazing. And I mean, I have the two best guys in the world, so I'm really happy. Tell us a little bit about um, your son. What's, what's he like? Is he, is he sleeping well, good baby? Yes. He has the sweetest temperament. He's really calm and... Um... Mm, he gets that from <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and he's been, he's just been the dream, so it's been a special couple days. Who does he take after? Does he look like anyone? We still can't figure that out. Everyone says that babies change so much over two weeks. We're basically sort of monitoring how the, uh, how the changing process happens over this next month, really. <laughs> but he's his looks are changing every single day, yeah. so who knows? And how you find parenting generally? What's it? Is it still a special moment? Yeah, it's great. I mean, parenting is amazing. It's, it's only been, what, two and a half days, three days? Yeah. Um, but we're just, we're just so thrilled to have, have our own little bundle of joy um, and be able to spend some precious times with him as he slowly, slowly starts to grow up. <laughs> and um, I hear you're going to off to see two special people in a minute. Yes. Um, the Queen and, and the Duke. Yes, and we just bumped into the Duke as we were walking by, which was so nice. So um, it'll be a nice moment to introduce the baby to more family, and my mom's with us as well. So it's uh, it's been a really... Here we go. Guys, thank you. Thank you all so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And thank you, everybody, for all the well wishes and the kindness. Mm -hmm. It's they it just means so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for the support. Thank you. Behind the tall walls of Windsor Castle is where fewer than 25 guests were invited to witness the newest royal baptism. Those invited taken discreetly to the tiny private chapel. Outside though, the streets were thronging with people. Those hoping to catch a glimpse of the royal christening though, were left disappointed. We do pay for the royal family, including uh, Meghan and Harry. And I think that they could have given us a little, you know, um, a little something. I think it should be public, you know, it always has been, why, why change it? It's their decision, it's their family, um, it's not as if they're direct uh, in line. And this royal watcher says the public may have to get used to this royal couple's desire for privacy. Well, it seems to be the case that Harry has decided he wants his little boy to have more of a private life. He feels he's a long way from the throne and wants to enjoy some type of privacy. But it could be a problem because no matter what you do, he is growing up in a royal goldfish bowl. He has got two of the most famous parents in the world. Today's christening is a very different royal event. Part of the continuing desire by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex to raise their son Archie out of the spotlight. And they're a couple determined to do things their own way. According to Harry, the royal family completely cut him off financially around the first quarter of 2020, when they decided to become independent from the royal family. This left him concerned for his safety and the safety of his family. He said that he now is living off his inheritance from his mother. The most complicated of all the issues raised by the couple's decision to step down is their protection, specifically what form it will take, who will provide it and who will pay for it. Prince Charles has agreed to keep funding the couple and their son from his own private income, but by stepping back, Harry and Meghan will now be able to work. There are still lots of details to work out, but Harry and Meghan will soon be embarking on a new life and a different kind of royalty. It was a terrible interview, which really did huge damage to the monarchy, to Britain as a whole, because Meghan talked about the country really being racist, and did huge damage to Harry's relationship with his father and with, with William. Harry also accused his father of cutting him off financially, which we now know actually wasn't true. We now know several things that were said in that interview were not true. 
Meghan claimed that she experienced racism from certain undisclosed members of the royal family who questioned her about Archie's skin color. They both suggested that someone in the family had made a racist remark about the color of the baby's skin. And Harry talked about William being trapped in a lifestyle and, and from which he had been trapped himself and hadn't realized he was trapped until Meghan had, had made it clear to him. You know, Megan herself has talked about the challenges of being biracial. She has said, you know, I wasn't black enough for the black roles, I wasn't white enough for the white roles, and I was in the middle as a mixed race woman. And her journey has been in part to find the strength and dignity and passion for that role and, and embodying a beautiful, strong, mixed race woman and all of that means. You know, Megan is re-educating people. There's never been a mixed race royal baby as we have now. And this is an incredible thing. I remember I was at the royal wedding when uh, Megan and Harry got married. I was in Windsor. And I remember there were a lot of women there who were black with little girls, with daughters, who were celebrating this special day. And people can't have any idea what a big deal this is for there to be a black princess, for there to be a mixed race princess, because we haven't had that before. And I think that just by virtue of the fact that Megan is who she is, inspires people, inspires young girls, inspires women, and that's a beautiful thing. The royal family cannot survive if it doesn't evolve and it, it, it reflect the world at large. And to be entirely white, it certainly does not do that. So Megan is representing, just by virtue of the fact that she's accomplished and beautiful and smart and talented and mixed race. And it's a wonderful thing. It's great for the royal family. It's great for everyone else. Oprah went on to clarify that the couple made it clear that it wasn't the Queen or Prince Philip that made these remarks. Either way, the palace released a statement addressing the alleged racism. The palace said recollections may vary, but the matters would be addressed privately. The big royal wedding that cost 40 million pounds and was watched by the world? Turns out it was all a performance. The couple claimed that they actually tied the knot in a secret ceremony three days before the big event in their backyard. Perhaps most troubling of all were Meghan's claims that she experienced real and frightening suicidal thoughts as a result of such intense tabloid scrutiny and isolation at the palace. Becoming a royal meant giving up a lot of personal luxuries and independence. Meghan also claimed that it was disparaging that the palace refused to correct false statements about her. There were rumors that Meghan was bullying some of the staff. Her method of working was not what they had been used to. Whether it was because she was American, whether it was because she was um, a, a movie star who treated people in a different way, it was not what had happened in the past within that royal household. And I think William, when he heard that some members of staff were being reduced to tears or not enjoying their working life, I think he got very angry and he confronted Harry and told him what was going on. And Harry, I think, was protective of Meghan. So that is where I think the seeds of it all, of, of a fracture in, in this bond that had been so close came from. Then, of course, Harry and Meghan left as working members of the family, left the country, went to Canada first, then America, and then gave that devastating interview to Oprah Winfrey, in which Meghan said that Kate had made her cry just before her wedding over a bridesmaid's fitting, where there had been a rumor long before that Meghan had made Kate cry. So in this interview, she wanted to correct that story and make it clear that Kate had made her cry. They both suggested that someone in the family had made a racist remark about the color of the baby's skin. And Harry talked about William being trapped in a lifestyle and, and from which he had been trapped himself and hadn't realized he was trapped until Meghan had made it clear to him. It was a terrible interview, which really did huge damage to the monarchy, to Britain as a whole, because Meghan talked about the country really being racist and did huge, huge damage to Harry's relationship with, with his father and with William. The main event in the Sussexes' lives has, of course, 
been the birth of their second child, Lilibet, in June 2021. My husband and I are thrilled to soon be welcoming a daughter. It's a feeling of joy we share with millions of other families around the world. When we think of her, we think of all the young women and girls around the globe who must be given the ability and support to lead us forward. Their future leadership depends on the decisions we make and the actions we take now to set them up and to set all of us up for a successful, equitable, and compassionate tomorrow. Just days after their daughter's birth, Megan released her children's book, The Bench, inspired by a Father's Day poem she wrote for Harry. It became a New York Times bestseller within a week of release. The couple have also taken part in their fair share of activism. On her 40th birthday, Megan filmed a video with U.S. actress Melissa McCarthy to launch her 40 by 40 mentorship campaign, raising awareness about the women globally who have lost their jobs as a result of COVID. As campaign chairs of Vax Live, my husband and I believe it's critical that our recovery prioritizes the health, safety, and success of everyone, and particularly women who have been disproportionately affected by this pandemic. With the surge in gender-based violence, the increased responsibility of unpaid care work, and new obstacles that have reversed so much progress for women in the workplace, we're at an inflection point for gender equity. Women, and especially women of color, have seen a generation of economic gain wiped out since the pandemic began, nearly five and a half million women have lost work in the U.S., and 47 million more women around the world are expected to slip into extreme poverty. But if we work together to bring vaccines to every country and continent, insist that vaccines are equitably distributed and fairly priced, and ensure that governments around the world are donating their additional vaccines to countries in need, then we can begin to fully rebuild not only to restore us to where we were before, but to go further and rapidly advance the conditions, opportunity, and mobility for women everywhere. For all the scrutiny that Harry and Meghan have to endure, it's easy to forget the couple is using their platform as a way to reach out to others through their work in public service. From building their Archwell Foundation in 2020 to the small ways the couple gives back, Harry and Meghan continue to work and find ways to leave a positive impact on the world and create a better future for their children. Meghan Markle is not someone who just wants a pretty designer dress and, and a glass of champagne. She is actually engaged and interested in the politics and the storylines of where they're going. In fact, she got in trouble when she met someone in Ireland who was in Parliament, I believe, and congratulated them on the defeat of a bill that would have uh, nullified abortion in Ireland and said, you know, that's great, and ended up getting in trouble because the, the Irish po politician tweeted, oh, I had this great conversation with Megan and she congratulated us on the defeat of this um, initiative. And everybody was like, you can't take a side, Megan. You can't defend any position. I think one of the most difficult, challenging things for this whole, in this whole experience for Megan is the royal tradition of not taking a side, of not uh, showing your political leanings, of not having opinions. That is something that I think Meghan Markle ha has already and will very much continue to struggle with. Two years after Prince Harry and Meghan Markle stepped back as senior members of the royal family, the couple returned to the UK for an exceptional reason. Harry and Meghan saw the Queen on a low-key visit before attending the 2022 Invictus Games in the Netherlands. The secret visit came almost a year after Prince Philip's funeral, which had been the last time Prince Harry was believed to have reunited with the Queen and the extended royal family. On September 8, 2022, while Meghan and Harry were in London preparing to attend a charity event, Queen Elizabeth II died at Balmoral Castle in Scotland. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow.
On September 10, 2022, the new Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine, were joined by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex at Windsor to view the tributes to the Queen and spent time talking to the crowds. There was mixed reactions from the people there. This was the first time since March 2020 that the two couples had been seen together. When it was finally announced that the Queen had died, there was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because, you know, the majority of, of the Queen's subjects had never known um, another monarch. And it was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death. It was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. And, of course, it was all so dramatic and so beautifully staged that that made it even more poignant. The, the you know, the soldiers, the, the wonderful music, the people that used to work for the Queen, walking behind her coffin was very, very moving. And uh, the crowd, we know, was, was crying. Or, or, or they were crying, or they were cheering, um, or they were just silent, completely silent. You could hear a pin drop. I remember when Diana died uh, and the day of her funeral, you, you, could, you could actually, you could just hear the birds. You couldn't hear anything else. No sound from the crowd. And that is a sort of real high emotion. The couple then went on to attend the late Queen's funeral, with Harry marching behind the coffin along with his family. In her life of service, we saw that abiding love of tradition, together with that fearless embrace of progress, which makes us great as nations. The affection, admiration, and respect she inspired became the hallmark of her reign. That was more than a promise. It was a profound personal commitment which defined her whole life. She made sacrifices for duty. Her dedication and devotion as sovereign never wavered through times of change and progress through times of joy and celebration, and through times of sadness and loss. It seems that despite Harry and Meghan's attempt to outrun the media and start a new life in Los Angeles, that storm has caught up with them. Once again, they're on every front page and in everyone's mouths. Their attempt at privacy backfired. But their attempt to tell their side of their own story seems to have only emboldened both sides of opinion. The reconciliation that seemed to be on the horizon between Harry and his family now seems impossible. The cracks that split the royal family and these former royals has now become a great divide.